century BCE. So these types of treaties were all around um, the area of Mesopotamia, and the Israelites had easy access to these. They knew about these, and so they could easily borrow from these in their development of the covenant or the contract that they would have between Yahweh and the people of Israel. And so these are the marks of the ancient Near East Treaty or covenant that you would see between a king and then a vassal. Um, it would start off with a preamble, you would have a historical prologue, and then there would be stipulations as to what would be going on um, between the vassal and the king. Um, there would be a tablet cl clause usually basically saying that this covenant, this contract would be written on tablets and it would be kept in a special place. Um, then you have witnesses to the covenant that were taking place and then um, curses and blessings. You know, blessings if you followed this covenant and curses if you didn't follow this covenant. And so what I wanted to do is actually take a look at the correlations that we have between this type of treaty and then the um, covenant that we see in the, uh, the Exodus narratives. Now, um, the narrative itself spans more than just the book of Exodus. It goes through the first five books of the Bible that we have. So um, all the way up and through uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy and all these other books, we actually have this is part of the covenant or the contract. It's a huge contract that we have between the Israelites and, um, and Yahweh. So the first thing we can look at is the preamble and the historical prologue. Now, I suggest maybe that the entire book of Genesis is the historical prologue that we have um, for this covenant, this contract that we have. But it's most clearly seen in Exodus 22. And so let's take a look at that. So Exodus 22, I the Lord am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. And so there's a short little history right there. I'm the Lord your God, so we have the preamble, who is this? And then we have who brought you out of the land of Egypt in slavery. And so we have that, and if we look at the handout, we can sort of compare that to what we see with the preamble and the historical documents there. So these are the words of the son or the king uh, Mercilus, the great king, the king of Hatti lands, the valiant, the favored of the storm god, the son of, I'm not even trying that word, the king, the great king, the king of Hatti land, the valiant. And so there's the preamble there declaring who this is, somebody who is great, and then you have the historical prologue, and then you can see in this one it sort of a, is a longer history that we have. Um, but it's a history nonetheless, saying usually what this king has done for the vassal. And we see that in the biblical uh, text as well, what Yahweh has done for the Israelite people. Now the next thing we have are the stipulations. And that's really mostly what we um, see in the Exodus narrative and in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy um, are these stipulations that we have or legal uh, edicts that we have between uh, Israelite and Yahweh. So if we look at Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods besides me. And we can see clearly um, in this example here as well that the Hittite king says that you shall have no other king besides me. And you can see that in many of the different treaties where the king declares that um, there should be servitude to this and only this king, to me and only me, and nobody else. Um, and we can easily see that in the Exodus narrative. And then there are other examples there that you can look up later as well in Leviticus, um, in Deuteronomy, just all throughout the biblical witness we have. Now the tablet clause. 
And the example that you have here, the tablet clause actually comes near the end um, with the curses and the blessings. The words of the treaty and the oath that are inscribed on this tablet. And so it's assuming that there is a tablet. Now, um, there was probably actually a more specific tablet clause somewhere in this treaty, but there are large gaps or gaps in the treaty that we have, and I've marked where the gaps are. And so you can see that you know, even this treaty was marked on tablets. And everyone knows, right, that the Ten Commandments were written on the tablets that we have. Um, but there are also other indications that the law itself was written down. Um, if we look at Deuteronomy 31, uh, 10 through 11. Let's go ahead and look at that one. And I'll actually only just read 11. When all of Israel goes to appear before the Lord your God in the place uh, which he chooses, you shall read the law aloud in the presence of all of Israel. And so we can see that the law itself was written down somewhere, and it was going to be read to the people. Um, and there are there other examples here. Uh, Exodus 34, 27 through 28, Exodus 24, 4, and Exodus 25, 21. And those three examples from Exodus are actually the three different sources um, that we have. Uh, the, the Yahweh source, the priestly source, and the Elohist source. Uh, basically saying the same thing, that this law needs to be written down, and it will be written down, and um, it needs to be read again. The next part, the witnesses. Usually in the uh, vassal treaties that we have, it lists a whole bunch of different gods, um, usually of the king and then of the vassal as well, who are witnessing um, this treaty, this treaty between the, the two parties. Um, obviously, we couldn't have that in the um, biblical text itself because of the monotheism that we have inherent in it for Israel. And so what we usually see for the witnesses um, is Yahweh is the witness, as well as the heavens and the earth. And if I can find my notes, I have a reference for that somewhere. Deuteronomy 30, 19. So let's look at that. I call heaven and earth today to witness against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So you can see there that heaven and earth are the witnesses. God, God's self is the witness to this covenant. And so we don't have um, this list, this huge list of other, other deities that are actually watching uh, this covenant between the two. And you can see in the example here, the Hittite example, that the witnesses are extensive. There is a large, large list of different gods, various gods that are um, being witness to this covenant. And then the cursings and blessings. Now these cursings and blessings don't take, play a major role in the covenant for the, for the Israelites. Much of what we see in the covenant of the Israelites are not curses and blessings per se, but prescriptions for how to deal with somebody who breaks the law in a legal way. This was not judgment um, coming down from heaven, but rather um, judgment from a uh, group of judges or from the king or from whoever would take control of Israel. And so the curses and blessings part is not a major role, but we do see um, a few examples of it. One of the examples is uh, Exodus 25, 6 through 8. And we'll actually take a closer look at this one um, when we get into the Ten Commandments itself. And it goes, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, inflicting punishment for their father's wickedness on the children of those who hate me, 
down to the third and fourth generations, but bestowing 